Hey parents, I'm really excited to start this series with you. The purpose of this series is to learn together how our teenager's story can be a part of a bigger story. The bigger story of our family, the bigger story of our community, the bigger story of God's story. And we're going to be focusing on five different values over the next couple of weeks. If you want to dive in into those topics even deeper, I'm pulling most of my resources and ideas from the book Parenting Beyond Your Capacity by Reggie Joyner and Carrie Newhoff. Now each week, I'll give you something to try or think about as we work together in leading the next generation. And before we start, I want to give one disclaimer. I personally am not in the phase of life where I'm parenting a teenager. However, my job that I love is to partner with you and what you're already doing and to offer resources for you as you navigate parenting your middle schooler and high schooler. So let's get started. If you understand the physics behind using a lever of any kind, you have a visual of what it means to do something beyond your capacity. A lever enables you to move or lift something that would ordinarily exceed your ability. Now, I'm a pretty big guy and like to think that I can move more weight around when I need to. But even I have to be able to recognize my limits and know when it's time to ask for help. So I want you to imagine three levers with different functions. Each of these levers do different things and all are extremely important. All of them together represent the primary influences that will determine how your student sees themselves, how they view the world, how they make decisions, or how they relate to people. So the first lever, this lever enhances your child's relationship with you. All of this happens when you make it a priority to be with them and be present physically and emotionally. It also is a result of communicating consistently with them that you would rather fight for their hearts than with them. When you create a rhythm and use teachable moments to speak into their lives, you're leveraging your relational experiences to bond and build memories that fuel their emotions. Lever two advances your child's relationship with God. No one has more potential to activate this lever like you do. As the parent, you are the one who can monitor their hearts, their character, and their faith. You are also the one who has the most influence to model what it looks like to show and give grace to other people that can only come from God. When you push this lever, you also recognize that their relationship with God is far more important than their relationship with you. You are guiding them into a relationship with a God that can offer them hope and love unlike any other person can give. And lever three, this connects your child to their relationship with those outside of your home. This lever becomes more important the older your kids get, and we're going to spend a good majority of our time today focusing on this lever. So the author of this book, Reggie Joyner, shares a story about how his son began pulling away his sophomore year in high school, and it all centered around this girl that he was dating and the group of friends that he was hanging out with. Now, they weren't bad kids, they just demanded a lot of his son's time and attention. But one night, his son came home late, and they finally had a conversation about his choices. And his son said, Dad, I'm not going to tell you what's going on. Now, Reggie is a pretty calm person naturally, so he moved in emotionally and said, his son's name was RP. RP, this is me. You know I care about you. I need you to tell me what's going on because I'm your father. And Reggie says, then he, had, then he said something, his son, that caught him off guard. None of his children had ever said it. It was gutsy, it was honest, but it shocked him. His son said, no, you don't understand, Dad. I'm not going to tell you because you are my father. You make the rules. And this shocked Reggie, and it caused him to pause the conversation until the next day while he got advice from his wife and his mentor. It ultimately took him to set his pride aside, and when he came back together with his son, he asked him, okay, if you're not going to tell me, when, when and who will you talk to? His son quickly gave the name of a close family friend who also happened to be one of his leaders at church. So for your parents, if you ask your student, who would you talk to if you couldn't talk to me about something, would they have an answer? Who would they say? Unfortunately for parents of middle schoolers and high schoolers, a time will come when your student will need another adult in their life besides you. And this is why our small groups are such a huge part of our ministry at Southern Hills. When I first started out in ministry, I noticed two things. Number one, students would come in five minutes after I would start teaching, and they would leave as soon as I said the final amen of the prayer. And two, because of that, they didn't have a consistent adult walking alongside of them, helping them navigate the waters of adolescence. So I realized uh, in ministry that, that it was not and could not be about me doing everything. I needed a team of people, and it wasn't just anybody that I needed. I needed the right people on my team. 
Now the adults that we have investing in our students are, are absolute rock stars. They have helped me through this transition of ministry and have made things seem so seamless as our small groups and 100% of our ministry have moved online. So the main question I want us to focus on is this. What are some specific things you are doing to encourage your teen's relationship with people outside the home? In Deuteronomy 6, Moses is addressing the people of Israel. This is one of the most famous passages of, of Scripture that we look at when it comes to challenging parents in the spiritual life of the family. And in this passage, Moses starts off by saying, Hear, O Israel. Now notice that he doesn't say, Okay, hear, O Israel. Here, listen to An Anderson's, listen to me. Listen to me, Cody and Jenny Good. Moses is talking to the entire nation of Israel. The culture of the Israelites was all about community. There weren't only moms and dads, but there were grandparents, aunts, uncles, and other adults who wanted to see the next generation succeed and thrive in the audience that Moses was talking to. So how do we rediscover the principle of wider circle community that existed in this Hebrew story? How do we rally parents and churches to see how strategic they are in nurturing the hearts of children? As a parent and minister at Southern Hills, I believe one of the greatest values of the church is its potential to provide community to, to my kids and your kids. A wider circle gives them not only a place to belong, but a significant role to engage in the bigger story of God's story. Seth Godin makes this observation. Human beings can't help it. We need to belong. One of the most powerful of our survival instincts is to be a part of a tribe. Now, children and teenagers, they need more than just a family that gives them unconditional acceptance and love. They need a tribe that gives them a sense of belonging and significance. So how do we do this? Here's some ideas. Number one, parents, make a list of five to seven names of people that you know and trust to ask to be a spiritual investor in the life of your teen. Number two, ask your teenager to make a list of five to seven names of people they know and trust that they could ask to be someone who walks alongside of them. Number three, compare those lists and see if there's any common names and then invite those people over to dinner and ask them if they would be willing to journey alongside of your teams. Number four, for the ones who say yes, ask them to commit to spending one day or afternoon with your student. Have them share whatever life advice that they want and to take your student to do whatever they want. It could be fishing, hiking, go get coffee, play at prime time or bowling. You'll, number five, you'll also want to get your student a notebook so they can take notes throughout this time of what each person has shared with them. Number six, after everyone has had a chance to spend time with them, have another night where you invite everyone over at the same time and have a celebration. Have each of the mentors share the gifts they see in your student. Number seven, then let your student share some of the things they learned in front of the whole group. And then finally, finish the night off by having a time of prayer of blessing. Now, I want you to think about something for a second. For the first 10 to 12 years, parents are the tour guide in the life of their kid. Tour guides walk alongside of the traveler, answering questions and prompting conversations along the way. But as they get older, teenagers' needs and desires change just like your role does. Parents now shift into more of a travel agent. Travel agents take a step back. They make arrangements and give directions. Now, this doesn't mean your teenager doesn't need a tour guide anymore. But maybe it's that your role to help is, is to help surround them with more voices who are on the same page as you as the parent. Your voice still matters, parents, but it's not the only voice that matters. Heather Zimple leads programs for spiritual growth at National Community Church in Washington, D.C. And she says, as we widen our children and teenagers' circles to include more tour guides and fewer travel agents, the influence of others will foster lifelong effects. Have you ever tried to tell your kids something and they ignored it only to come home one day saying someone else said the exact same thing and it was, and it was the best thing ever? Well, the goal here is for you to pursue uh, strategic relationships so another adult voice will be speaking into your teen's life, saying the kind of things that you would try to say as a parent. You know, we want to be the hero. We want to be the one they listen to. And we want them to think that we are the amazing ones. But we have to remember that the right values that are left in them are more important than who leaves them there. Because in the end, it's Jesus who's putting it on their hearts. The message will get to their hearts regardless of the method. And the last thing I want to leave you with is a message about serving. One of the best things we can do for the next generation is to give them opportunities to be the church rather than just being at church. 
you know, we can't underestimate the value of what serving others does to the hearts of our students. And I want to encourage you to find ways that they can serve locally and eventually internationally. We have opportunities every year for families to go overseas and to serve the people in a third world country. We also have opportunities every week and every month for families to serve somewhere in our community. And here's a big truth that I have to remind myself when it comes to students. They'll never feel significant until we give them something significant to do. So when you widen the circle, the goal is to have other trusted adults in the lives of your teens before they need them so that they will be there when they need them. They need someone who has gone before them to be for them. We have been called to be in community. We have been called to lead the next generation faithfully. And we have been called to widen the circle.